Hello, welcome. We've made it to Monday of week eight uh, due to some sort of time sorcery, I'm sure. Uh, aside from being Monday of week eight, this is perhaps the most important day in this class. Does anyone have a guess as to why? Man. Is it your birthday? It is not my birthday. Good guess. Is there anything? We're learning about a cool president. Uh, all the presidents are cool, but yes, we will learn about uh, about one today. That's on the right track. It's, oh, it is President's Day. It's President's Day. <laughs> Happy President's Day. Uh, we've talked about a lot of them so far. Van Buren. Uh, Henry Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, of course, Johnson, Grant, Rutherford, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland again, McKinley, and then Roosevelt. And so we have nine, nine presidents left to talk about before our journey together is done. All right. So... I asked you to come uh, with as many questions as you could about Lab 6, the KD Tree Lab. So to get us warmed up for that, uh, I have this question for you. Why is a binary search tree not a good choice when we want to search multidimensional keys? Uh, I mean, I, I was thinking of the, the like theoretical physics multiverse concept, but you know, any any multiverse will suffice. All right, let's see what we're thinking on this one. Uh, the, the multiverse being dangerous is not the reason why binary search trees are not a good choice. Uh, can someone explain what what this means? The keys will be sorted only one by dimension. Why is that a problem? Oh, yeah. Exactly. That sorting along only one of our dimensions means that we can't efficiently search along any other dimensions. All right. So I hope that you took the time to read over lab six. What questions do you have uh, at this point? Okay. This might be a really bad question, but I'm still confused about what an axis aligned rectangle is and how that corresponds to a node. Yes, so great question. Um, let me bring up a picture here. All right, so the lab mentions that you might use these rect HV objects uh, to keep track of the rectangle that kind of each node represents. Uh, and so it also, the write-up also uses this phrase axis aligned rectangle, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, the rectangle is like aligned with the x and y axis. It's not sort of tilted or anything. It kind of has uh, a width along the x and a, and a height. Uh, like HV stands for horizontal and vertical. It's just represented by these two numbers, uh, horizontal size, vertical size, and then a position. So what 
do these rectangles mean in the context of a KD tree? So we can look at this. This is a, actually let's look back here. Our uh, KD tree insertion from last time. And so these rectangles would represent kind of the region of, the, of space that the node corresponds to. So in this current tree, uh, A being the root would have a rectangle that is kind of infinity in all directions. Like any point anywhere would fall kind of underneath A somewhere. Z, however, would have a rectangle that has an, uh, a kind of a left side of two, but then would also be infinity in the other three directions, meaning that kind of anything to the right of A would be a child of Z. And as we add more nodes, these each have their own rectangles. C would have a rectangle with an x-coordinate of two and a y-coordinate of two kind of going out kind of into infinity. Uh, and D here kind of would be bounded on three sides and kind of it, but correspond to any y-coordinate above, above two. And the reason these rectangles are useful is that uh, when we're, say, searching for uh, the nearest thing or, or searching in a range, uh, we can use the rectangle from the node to check, like, is the, could the thing we're looking for be a child of a particular node by saying, how does it relate to the, uh, the rectangle for that node? So the rect HV has a method to compute the distance between the rectangle and a point. It has a method to check, uh, does it true or false? Does it intersect another rectangle? And so you can think of it we're looking for the nearest thing. We could use the rectangle of the node to say, okay, th this rectangle tells us the region of space that children of this node uh, could be in. What is the distance from the point we're looking for to this rectangle? Like, what is the closest point that could be within uh, this part of the tree? Or we're looking for a range of points, which would be represented by another rectangle. We're going to ask do two rectangles overlap. So there's just a lot of these kind of geometrical questions that we're going to want to uh, answer as we search the tree and kind of keeping track of these rectangles will simplify doing that. You could be writing the code to do kind of line intersections and distance kind of uh, without using the rect HV, uh, but a lot of that code already exists in this class. Uh, and so that will be, that will be useful, I think. Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. Thank you. What other lab six questions do you have for me? That's right. Calling it a KD tree because that's the sort of name of the general data structure. But yes, we are particularly coding up a two D tree. So it doesn't need to be a yeah, just needs to handle two D points as the keys. That's it. So just kind of splitting on X and Y and in alternation. Ben. Oh. So you have the KD tree like class, right? But then you have to implement like your specific like like you have to have your fields for like your note, your point, your values. So you can't like do the, any of the methods without implementing like your actual like things first, right? Uh, are you saying before you can get started on the tree, you would need to like implement a a, a 2D point class? Is that what you're yeah. suggesting? Yes, so we absolutely need a, a 2D point class and this rectangle class. Uh, both of these are already implemented in the ALGS4 library. And there are links to kind of the documentation uh, of them from the lab. Uh, so uh, no. go away. Um, 
just to pull up the starter code here. Not that one. There we go. You can do it. Um, yeah, so you can see that the, the point 2D and the rect HV are, are already imported here at the top, so uh, you can just use them. You, you don't need to implement them yourself. Charlie. Mm -hmm. What the a, a node? Um, it seems like we have like some implementations of that. Uh, yes, so I don't believe there's any implementation of a of a node uh, in the KD tree. So um, I think a good and I think the the write up mentions this, but a good reference for this tree implementation is our binary search tree implementation and in the list of resources at the top of the write-up it links to, to a bst.java and so you would need to implement some sort of kind of internal node class like that i think the write-up has some suggestions like a node probably needs uh, it will need a point uh, it will need a value it will probably want to keep track of a rectangle um, uh, it needs to have two two children um, that sort of thing but yeah you need to uh, make a make your own node class Other questions? All right, since no one asked about it, I'm just going to talk about it anyway. Um, one of the methods you are asked to implement is this points method that uh, returns something you can iterate over that contains all the points in the KD tree. So a link list is an iterable, an array list is an iterable, or anything you can use in a for each loop is an iterable. Uh, and this specifically requires that you return them in level order. And uh, this is a kind of tree traversal that we didn't, uh, that I didn't have time to, to go through uh, in class when we talked about tree traversals. We talked, uh, can anyone remember uh, a traversal that we did talk about in classes ago? Everything? In order? Yeah, we talked about an in-order traversal, kind of way to visit the nodes of a tree to kind of get all our keys in kind of sorted order. Uh, <laughs> Just throwing up a tree. This is not a not a binary search tree, or at least I am not showing you the keys that would make this sorted. Uh, but a level order traversal is we go through the nodes by levels. So we would have kind of everything at level one, which would be A. Then everything at level two, I have one level down, left to right, B, C. And then everything at the next level, again left to right, E, D, F. Um, and uh, our kind of in order traversal, we implemented in a recursive way. Our level order traversal is most easily implemented using a loop and using a, some sort of data structure that can act as a queue. Uh, and the idea is that we have, that we keep track of kind of nodes that we will visit. And so we have nodes. Always hiding the erasers. We have some nodes to visit that is going to be a queue, have first in, first out behavior. Uh, anyone have a suggestion for a, a Java data structure that can give us first in, first out? Well, yeah, we could use our, our uh, 
array deck would be a, a nice choice. But, um, and we're going to start this uh, out containing the root. So we're going to start off with A. And then we will say while while there are nodes left to visit, so like while the size of our our nodes to visit Q is greater than zero. Uh, We'll remove a node from the queue. We'll then process the node. And I'm writing process here in red because what would go here is whatever the level order traversal wants to do when it visits a node. So could be printing it out. Uh, in the case of the lab, it should be like adding it to whatever iterable of all the nodes you're building up. And then after you process a node, we then add all of that node's children to our nodes to visit. So if we walk through how this would work on this example tree, uh, we put A into our nodes to visit. We then remove A inside our loop. At that point, we process A. Do that in red. Uh, and then which nodes would we add to our Q next. Ma'am? B and C. Yeah, the children of our current node. So we'd have B and C. Then we go back around. Our Q is not empty. Remove the first one. Process B. And then add B's children to our Q. And note, because our queue has kind of first in, first out, even though at this, even though we process B and then add its children, C got put in our queue before that. So we'll kind of finish with this. We'll finish with all the children of A before we get to anything else that is put in our queue. Then we'd remove C, process C, add. D and F to our queue, and then process each of those, not putting anything else in the queue because none of those have any children. All right, does this level order uh, make sense? What are your What are your questions on this tree traversal? All right, one thing that I think is kind of cool about this is that we have this kind of nice, concise algorithm for traversing a tree in this new way. And it's powered by this other data structure, a queue, that we saw earlier. So kind of, and often when we want to kind of process some structure from some starting point kind of out gradually further and further, a queue is a nice, a nice way of doing that. Because it's kind of each of additional distance that we go from our starting point, that gets into the queue and we'll go through it before we get to anything even further out. And, and we'll see this, we'll see algorithms like this um, in the future when we talk about graphs. All right, anything else on, on lab six I can talk about before we move on? Ben. Oh. 
for testing, there's no test cases, so we just like put them in the main method and kind of put like each one in, and then it should be like what we have with the picture. Uh, so there are. So there are. Um, yeah, so this lab does not provide uh, test cases that are going to say like yes, passed, or, or no automatically. Uh, but there is um, some detailed kind of testing uh, steps. Um, where, uh, so initially, you'll want to. Um, uh, test by writing a, a main method, and in particular, once you have, uh, uh, once you can uh, do, uh, uh, once you can put values into your KD tree, and you implement this level order traversal, um, then you can write a main method that puts some things into the tree, and then in a loop uses this points method to go over all the nodes, and you. Uh, and if it's going over in level order, you should be able, for a small tree, you can by hand figure out what will it look like, what will the level order traversal be, and is your tree printing out the nodes in the order you expect. Uh, for, um, uh, uh, for the, the range and nearest methods, as well as for the structure of the, the tree, um, there are these visualizer files um, where you can, uh, uh, as described here, like uh, if you run the um, KD tree visualizer, um, you'll see, you should see a box pop up uh, that asks for uh, program arguments. Uh, you'll put in one of these kind of input uh, file names because then the KD tree will read those files to get the points uh, to, that it will, will use. So if we look at input eight, for example, here are the eight points with an X and Y, and it will add those to the tree in that order. And when you do that, uh, you should expect to see a picture like this showing you what, this, uh, uh, what the tree looks like in terms of how it's dividing up the space. And so you'll be able to use these visualizers to tell kind of is, uh, is it constructing the tree correctly for the range and nearest. You'll be able to drag a box or click a point and it will highlight what your tree says is in that range or is nearest. And you can visually see, is it, is it doing the correct thing? Um, yeah, so this being a highly visual data structure, Debugging it visually is, is going to be pretty handy, I think. Other questions? All right. So today there are uh, a couple kind of new uh, trees that I want to talk about. Uh, the first is how do we implement a tree which is actually going to be balanced? Because up until now, whenever we've analyzed the efficiency of a binary search tree, it's always been with a kind of hand waviness that, oh, let's assume this is balanced. Let's assume it's not just like a linked list chain of nodes. When a tree, does anyone remember why having the tree be balanced is uh, what lets us say it has log n efficiency in the worst case? Serafine? Having a balanced tree makes this so that we can uh, not look at one side of the tree every time we read over it. Yes, that's, that's a good way of putting it. When we have a balanced tree, if we go left or right, we're getting rid of about half of uh, the potential nodes uh, because we know there's kind of roughly the same depth 
on, on either side. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that all of our binary search tree operations involve starting at the root and going all the way to the leaf. That is kind of visiting a number of nodes equal to the height of the tree. And having it balanced means that we can't have one really, really long side. It's just like a long chain of nodes, because otherwise that would, that would not be balanced. And a balanced tree has kind of logarithmic height uh, in terms of the number of nodes. So this is all to say we'd really like a binary search tree that can keep itself balanced, or a self a self-balancing binary search tree. Something that has kind of the property of, of keeping nodes in order, but also can keep itself balanced. So there are different varieties of self-balancing trees. Uh, in the reading to, for today, there are two kinds. Uh, it talks about two kinds of trees that I'm not going to, to cover. One kind of simpler one called a splay tree, and one more complex one called a red black tree. Today I want to kind of sketch out how something called an AVL tree is going to work. Uh, AVL comes from the names of the people who came up with this data structure, uh, named Adelson, Velsky, and Landis. Um, gave it gave the tree its name. And our AVL tree is going to have the fastest lookups of any of these three. because it maintains the strictest balance of the three. Uh, these ones will have somewhat faster inserts, faster to add a node uh, to the tree because they are a little more relaxed. They don't require that the tree is perfectly balanced. So there's some trade-offs here. Uh, if we we're wondering, you know, what does uh, the version of Java in the computer labs, I think it's Java 11, uh, if I say, what does Java 11's tree map data structure use? I can go to their documentation uh, and say, ah, so Java has this red black tree uh, in its tree map implementation. Uh, they even tell us that the algorithms come from this particular Introduction to Algorithms textbook. Uh, so this is a nice thing about Java's documentation. It will actually tell us kind of what data structures and algorithms uh, the Java standard library uh, actually uses. Uh, so red black tree is Java's choice. Um, so our AVL tree has a few properties. In fact, it's just two that we're going to maintain. The first is the binary search tree property that we're already familiar with. Nodes to the left are smaller. Nodes to the right are greater. And we're also going to maintain this balance property, which says that the difference in heights between uh, the children of a node, the left and the right subtree, 
is less than or equal to one. So this is the strict balance property that we're never going to let the tree uh, get uh, any more than just a kind of the minimum possible amount unbalanced. Like we couldn't have this be zero because then we wouldn't be able to have a tree like this. Or like this, like this, there's no more balanced we can make a tree with four nodes than this. So it's going to be OK that this node's children have a height that is different by one. But we wouldn't allow this. Now they're two different, and it would violate this, this balance property. With me so far, questions on these AVL properties? In. So it says the difference in heights has to be like less than or equal to one. How could like the difference be less than one? Like, it's not always like isn't the close isn't the best you get like with the difference always equal to one? Uh so in this tree. Uh, my leaves have height zero, uh -huh. and then this node, the difference in the heights of its children uh, is also zero. Okay. Because specifically, each node is making sure that its children aren't very unbalanced. Oh, I see. Yeah, because this notion of balance is always like comparing the left and the right side. Um, and so we, we, I think it would be hard to define what balance meant if we were just looking at a single node. So in this case, we're looking at its two children. They have to have uh, the same height or heights that are different by one. Other questions? All right, so to talk about some uh, examples, If we add a tree like so, all following our uh, binary search tree property, we could go through and could write the height on, on, on each of these nodes. Um, We'd say, okay, our leaves are all height zero, and then it, and then eleven is kind of one above a leaf, four one above a leaf, eight. What would the height of eight be? Yeah, it would be we're kind of two away from the the most distant leaf, uh, and that would make six a height of three. Uh, so is this tree following our balance property? Yeah, we can look at any node and the height of its children uh, is kind of different by at most one. We don't have any one that has uh, different in heights of, of uh, more than one. So this is an ABL tree. Uh, if I change this slightly, Take a look at this. Does this tree follow our AVL balance property? Where, what are what are the the 
What is the node whose children are not balanced? Jeffrey? Four. Why four? Because the height of four would be uh, three. Uh, so how about the heights of its children? Oh, I see. Uh, heights of the children, one would be two, and then five would be zero. Exactly. So four is a place where you have children that now they're different by more than one. This wouldn't be a valid AVL tree. It is not balanced. Does that make sense? Sure. In that case, would it be six then? Because the children four would be three, and then eight would be one. Uh, yes, great point. That uh, we're typically going to be concerned with kind of finding the, uh, uh, the the first node that is out of balance, because that's where we'll want to like fix up the tree to make it balanced. Um, but yes, in this case, six and four are both violating our balance property because they each have children that, that aren't balanced. Other questions? All right, so how are we actually going to make this, this work? Uh, what we'll do is for each Uh, for each AVL node, we can think of it as we're going to store a key, some value. We'll also store its height and its children. So our AVL node is really only different from our binary search tree node in that now we're keeping track of a height in addition to key value and children. So our, our strategy for inserting in an AVL tree is going to be we're going to insert at a leaf node in the tree just like we would in a binary search tree. So first we just do exactly what we would do with a binary search tree. Uh, however, after we insert this node, the tree may have become unbalanced as a result of this insertion, and we'll need to, to take corrective action. So, to go from the new node that we just inserted and kind of back up the tree kind of node to parent to parent to parent uh, all the way up to the root um, and we're going to check balance at that node because the new node that we have just inserted may have disrupted the balance of any node kind of along this path from the new node up to the root. Uh, that in this case, if we if two was the most recent node inserted, uh, inserting two here threw off the balance for. Uh, one, four, and six. So we can see that one has a node with uh, uh, height one, and we're actually going to uh, imagine that nodes that don't exist have a height of negative one in terms of 
we want to treat this situation as being out of balance because it's a chain of nodes and we could uh, 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 there's, we, we could fix this arrangement of three nodes to be, uh, to be uh, nicely kind of balanced rather than a chain. So we will kind of go back up to the tr through the tree, checking the balance of each node. And we're going to use uh, uh, something called a rotation of the tree in order to fix the balance. So let me walk through a small example to show you what I mean by rotation. Uh, we're going to insert six, and then insert three, and then insert one. And if you imagine what this would do in a normal binary search tree, uh, we'd get six in there, which would start off with uh, a height of, of zero. Then where would we insert three? The left side. Yeah, it would go to the left of six. Uh, we'd update our heights. Six is now height one, three is height zero. Still balanced so far. Then when we insert one, again, goes all the way to the left. Update our heights. So we go back up, three becomes one. Six is height two. Now, where is our imbalance? Uh, so is, is it the ch children of three that are out of balance? Well, if we are guessing that the children of six is negative one, then we have a problem because it's more than one day. Yeah, so six is the node that is kind of validate, violating our balance property because its children are, are different by more than one. So imagine that we could rearrange these three nodes into some other kind of tree structure uh, that was still a binary search tree. Um, what node could we put at the root uh, such that we could that we would fix this this balance issue? Ron? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Seraphine? Does that three be the root node? Yeah, three is kind of in between one and, and six, so it would be great if we could get three at the root, because then we'll have a left and a right child. And so we're going to do a rotation which says we're going to move now you can think of a rotation as literally kind of rotating the tree kind of turning the the, the tree where we're going to take the uh, the child of uh, uh, on un the unbalanced node uh, and move it into the parent position. Our parent will become the other child and then if there are other subtrees that have kind of been detached by this process, we'll kind of plug them in uh, the only place that a, a binary search tree would, would allow them to go. So in this case, we would move three, we still have one here, 
we would move three up to be the parent, and then six would end up the other child. So this would be uh, a right rotation. We kind of moved left to the right. Uh, we can also, when needed, do left rotations to kind of turn nodes the other way. And this actually fixed our balance issue. That kind of just kind of rotating the tree like this, now we have this nicely balanced uh, uh, three node tree. The other nice thing about this rotation is that uh, it just involved kind of these two nodes changing some left and right children, that even if this tree was much bigger, it it, this rotation would still involve kind of just a constant number of modifications to the tree. So this rotation operation is actually going to be constant time which means that even for very large trees, when we need to perform a rotation, it will still be very fast. What are your questions on this? Oh. What exactly does the rearrange subtrees mean if you have a big tree? Yes. So, uh, I'm deliberately keeping this vague because there are a number of different cases, and I don't think it would be that useful to kind of go through all of them in, in detail. Uh, I will show you an example of the kind of thing that I mean. Uh, so links from uh, the notes for today uh, is, again, this Visual Algo site, which we previously used it to look at binary search trees. They also have AVL tree animations. So I have a, a tree here, and I'm about to insert the key 79. So take from on and picture where in this tree would 79 go, and would it uh, require uh, rebalancing? We can go through and see how the insertion will work. Maybe. All right, appears to have died. All right, so let's insert. Seventy four. Go a little slower than they were going. So to insert, we start at the root and we compare seventy four to the root, tells us to go right, compare seventy four to sixty five, we go right, compare to ninety one, we go left, compared to seventy two, we go right. There's nothing there, so we found a leaf where we can insert our new key. So far, just like a binary search tree. Uh, and now we need to kind of go back up the tree following the same path to check has the balance been thrown off. So we check 72. It's balanced. We check 91. Is 91 balanced? Yeah, it has a height zero child and a height one child. So that'll be balanced. How about 65? No, it will have a, a height zero and a height two. And so that's gonna, going to be uh, an issue. And so now we're going to kind of wrote, need to do this rotation where we bring 91 uh, uh, or kind of one of the nodes over here anyway, is going to need to take the place of 65. Um, if we moved 91 up to 65, would that uh, 
would that give us a, a kind of balanced section of this tree? Liam? Are we swapping? Uh, well, we couldn't move 65 down here because it would need to be the left of 91. That's what I had. Yeah, so if we move 91, we'd have to rearrange the other nodes to be a correct binary search tree. So everything less than 91 would have to be to its left. Everything greater would have to be to its right. So, for example, we couldn't keep 72 and 74 kind of on the right side of 91. And we can see, in fact, we have four nodes here that are less than 91 and one node that's greater than. Uh, so moving 91 up is not a recipe to have this be balanced. Uh, so what we're going to need to do is to first rotate right to move 72 up to take the place of 91. And then after this rotate right, we then rotate left to move 72 up to where 65 is. So this is the kind of, th this is a lot of the, the messy detail uh, of these different cases um, that we, we won't go through every one. Uh, but these is the, uh, the four cases you either do one rotation or two rotations. And this was one of the two rotations case to get it into this nice balanced state. Questions on this? Luke. How do you know which number to rotate? Like, I mean, we're working out here, but then does the computer just tries like each one with the uh, Fortunately, no. There is a way to just know which rotations you need to do, uh, and it has to do with kind of which is the the higher child, and then is that higher child's subtree um, or. Um, yeah, you, which is the higher child, and then it, is it to the left and right, and does it, what, what children does that subtree have? And this gives us kind of four different cases that tell us exactly which rotations to do. Um, so, no, unfortunately, we don't have to just guess and check. Ron? Uh, why couldn't we have put 91 in the place of 65? Because wouldn't that have like, resulted in a, like in both sides having a height of two? Uh, not if we maintained the binary search tree property. So if we just had 91 here, and we still had these three nodes to its right, that would mean nodes that were less than it would be to its right, which is kind of not our everything to the right needs to be greater, everything to the left needs to be less. Uh, so in order to move 91 up, kind of all four of these would have needed to be on the left, uh, and that wouldn't have, have been balanced either. Difference. I was wondering what would be the complexity of the operation for when you add a leaf node into the uh, tree and then it checks every pair node. Else, would it be log in? Yes, great question. What would the what are the complexity of our AVL tree operations? Uh, so to insert, we go from the root all the way down to a leaf. We know that if a tree is balanced, that's log n, if there are n nodes in the tree. We then go from the leaf all the way back up to the root. That's another kind of log n. And if we have log n plus log n, what is our, what is our big O running time? Log n. Yeah, still log n. So it's fine to kind of do just two kind of log n uh, uh, times through, our, uh, uh, through the tree. And because this rotation is constant, it's just kind of a, a fixed number of kind of move this here, this there. Um, those don't uh, those don't impact our log n efficiency. Um, so uh, I was calling out kind of non uh, non asymptotic factors here, where AVL tree faster lookups because it has this perfectly balanced these faster inserts. They're still all log n on average. Um, they just have kind of slightly different uh, constant factors. Other questions? All right, so this gives us uh, 
a kind of updated table of map operation efficiency where uh, we can consider an unsorted array, a sorted array, a hash table, and a balanced binary search tree, such as our, our AVL tree. Um, and we can start to see uh, the trade-offs that are, are involved here, that our hash table for just our contains get input, because our hash function lets us jump immediately to the right spot, we have constant time performance for our hash table, uh, whereas our balanced uh, search tree, we do our login kind of path down through the tree. Uh, but when it comes to things that need a sorted order, like finding the minimum key or the maximum key uh, or the nearest uh, uh, point, uh, or, or the nearest key, then our hash table is no better than an unsorted array because that's what it actually is. It's an unsorted array. We've just identified indexes using our, our hash function. Uh, and our, our balanced binary search tree ha still has our login time. Um, and it's worth noting that our sorted array does great as long as you don't ever need to put anything new into it. As if we have a, a set of things that just is never changing, our unsorted, our sorted array could actually be the right choice. Uh, because we can just immediately go to the first element or the last element uh, uh, to, to do these. Uh, we can do binary search, which is just as good as uh, using our tree, but it's really when we have to kind of find the spot and then shift things over uh, that our, our sorted array uh, doesn't do so well. All right, questions on these, these efficiencies? We're about to, to put them into practice. All right. Let's give... this one a try. So let's say that we want to make a database of students uh, and GPAs. Uh, we'll need to, to look up specific students uh, as well as rank people by GPA. Uh, and we need to choose a data structure to, uh, to store this data and provide these operations efficiently. All right. So looks like our consensus is moving towards some kind of tree. Uh, I actually think that uh, I can see an argument for any of these four um, being being reasonable. Uh, I might at first use a balanced tree, uh, but I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm very certain that that would be the best choice. I would probably need more information or need to make assumptions about, uh, about this particular uh, scenario. So uh, does anyone want to, to make an argument for our, our sorted array? Ron? Uh, well, if you had all the GPAs and you want to tie them to a name, could you like store each of the um, like could you have each of the GPAs as like a key in a linked list and then organize them in an extensible array and then have the values be the students' names? Is that, is that possible? Or? Uh, so what are you imagining is the element like at a particular index in the array? Uh, the GPAs. Uh, and there would be separately a, a link list that would be tying them together. No, sorry. Each like each one of those GPAs would be like its own linked list that would have. Oh, I see. Or a name. I see. So, uh, yeah. I mean that 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 seems like uh, we could kind of find a particular GPA and then go through a link list to find all the names uh, associated with it. It's a little bit like. Uh, a hash table where the GPA is a key kind of tells us which index to go to, but in this one, our, our keys are in sorted order. Yeah, so that, that seems like it uh, could be reasonable. 
How about an argument for, for the hash table? Marcus? I just thought a hash table would make sense because to look up spe specific students, I thought that made sense for keys and values and trees. If you use, if you balance a tree by DPA, um, it'll be harder to find a specific student. Exactly. This the, it's a great point that the set of operations I have described, look up specific students and rank them by GPA. These even just these two together sort of say there's no one best data structure choice. Because if we want to given a name, look up information about someone, a hash table seems perfect. But now we want to rank them. Okay, a hash table's not going to be any better than an unsorted array when it comes to ranking. Uh, so you might even say, okay, I'm going to have two data structures, a hash table for lookups, a balanced tree for uh, ranking by GPA. Um, so now your operations are efficient, but you're using more memory because you're, you have the data twice and you risk it getting sort of out of sync where you make a change to one copy, but not the other. So I think this actually is a, a somewhat challenging kind of design question. And there, it's really about like, what are you, what do you want? What is most important? Is it most important that the ranking is fast or that the looking up people is fast? Um, and what other constraints do you have? Aiden? Why couldn't it be like a 2D tree and then you can sort by both like the and name? Yeah, so I, I think that would also be a, reason, a reasonable approach. That's, I think, the, the, a nice argument for a, for a 2D tree. Um, I think that that... Um, yeah, and so that kind of, that's, I think, a nice compromise between we're going to have uh, fairly efficient lookups for both name and GPA. Uh, neither is going to be as efficient as if, say, we were just sorting by one of those. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this is a, a situation where a 2D tree might, might be a nice choice. Other, other comments, questions? All right, I think the, the next two should be a little more straightforward. Now I want to make a simulation of a binary star system. This is kind of two suns, uh, two stars, and then also planets and moons and asteroids. Uh, and particularly I want to do the kind of gravitational uh, simulation where each object exerts uh, a force on each other object depending on their distance from each other. Uh, and so what data structure should I use to kind of keep track of all the all the things in my simulation? <clears throat> all right, majority for KD tree. I would agree with uh, with that here. Uh, can someone share uh, your case for using a KD tree? Sammy? The reason I thought of a KD tree was mainly because you're able to store points in a multi-dimensional plane, um, kind of like the universe. So then you would be able to have the name of the star, the location, as well as uh, its gravitational field, and then quickly do the math without having to take too much uh, memory space or it being too uh, non-efficient. Yeah, we have objects in 3D, so we can use a, a 3D tree. Uh, and. This is something that's actually used in practice for uh, uh, something called an n-body simulation. Uh, this is one that has, well, it's an ad for being an IT pro first. Uh, but 130,000 uh, individual kind of uh, bodies in this uh, kind of large, large structure. Uh, and you can kind of see all these individual points. It's computing kind of gravitational forces between them. And an optimization that's often used in these simulations is if there's stuff that's far enough away, you don't need to, like if there's 10,000 points like really, really far away, you don't need to compute the gravity of each individual point on because they're so far away, you can kind of treat them all as like one thing that's super far away. And a KD tree lets you sort of everything that's in this whole region I'm going to treat as, as one thing. So KD trees are, are pretty useful for these kind of, of simulations. Um, uh, since we're out of time, I'll also show you uh, there are 
uh, birds called starlings um, uh, that uh, form what are called murmurations. It's kind of giant uh, undulating clouds of, of starlings. Um, and uh, there's actually, and here you can see kind of a, a hawk that's flying around, maybe wants to, to eat some starlings. Uh, and provided in, in the lab is actually code to do what's called a Boyd simulation. Uh, named for for how someone from uh, New York or New Jersey might say bird Boyd, um, where you have uh, you you kind of use a KD tree because each of these simulated birds needs to respond to kind of the ones nearby. So you need to do a lot of sort of find the nearest bird or find the birds in this in this range uh, in order to efficiently do this sort of starling simulation. All right. So we're out of time for today. Uh, didn't get to the president, uh, so we'll, we'll come back. Can't, can't uh, miss Taft, good Taft stories. Uh, also did not get to a, a kind of tree that uh, will be on the quiz for this week, so I'll be moving the quiz to be out Wednesday due Friday instead of giving you a problem where, that you won't hear about the kind of tree until Wednesday. That doesn't seem fair. Uh, so I have office hours starting shortly. Uh, Otherwise, we'll see you Wednesday.